on the Rice Radio Sino Land in Chiang Mai, Thailand, and I am super happy to have on the show today journalist uh, Stephen uh, Sahuni uh, in Beirut. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing okay. How are you doing, Jeff? And uh, he is based in Beirut, uh, Lebanon, and manages the website uh, Mideast Discourse. And for those of you who don't know about my background, I've got some skin in the um, Arab and Muslim game uh, from, 18, uh, from 1980 to 1990. I lived and worked in the Arab world, and Arabic is still my favorite language. I love Arabic. It's still my favorite language to speak, read, and write, although it's very, very rusty after 16 years of Chinese buried on top. Um, I actually, Stephen, I actually started trying to, trying to study, now that I've got a little bit more time, I'm actually uh, studying it again. The Mideast is the pulse of the world, affecting every country across the planet on the geopolitical stage. To ignore it is to deny the future of humanity. It's that important. And Stephen is right at the heart of um, uh, the, uh, the Middle East in uh, Beirut. Uh, welcome to the show, Stephen, and thank you. Thank you for being here. Stephen, please tell us about yourself and how you ended up managing Mideast Discourse. And by the way, I'll put all of his contact information, website, and everything on the uh, in the article on China Rising. Go ahead, Stephen. Uh, I, I, I'm a Syrian American. Uh, I lived almost all of my life in Syria. I started uh, my journalism work in the year 2011, with the, uh, when the war on Syria started. I've written several articles uh, about, uh, actually in the hundreds, in several uh, news websites around the world. Uh, I write in both Arabic and English. My biggest article was, and my biggest hit was uh, the day before Dera. It explains how the war in Syria started and how it was planned uh, 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 before, before it started. Uh, I just kept moving from news website to news website, from an agency to agency, until in the end I uh, started uh, on this Mid East course managing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a really nice site. Um, so you are originally from Syria. Which uh, which which city are you from in Syria? Latakia. Latakia. Okay. Okay. So I've actually I, I've I've been in Syria several times back in the early '80s. So um, lovely people. Uh, in my first book, 44 Days, I wrote that the gates of Jerusalem have changed hands 44 times in its 5,000-year history and will undoubtedly change again. Uh, I also wrote that almost all global geopolitical events revolve around the fate of Jerusalem, even with far-off countries like China, and that this ancient city is like a barometer for what ails humanity. I also said that there is if there is a nuclear war, World War III, it will likely be started by Israel. Today, Jerusalem is in the hands of settler colonial Zionist Israel, which is committing daily genocide on the Palestinian people, especially in Gaza, which is the world's largest open-air concentration camp. With Western imperial vetoes in the, uh, in the United Nations Security Council, with uh, the United States, the United Kingdom, and France, we are powerless to stop the slaughter, and for 70 years, daily Western crimes against humanity have become normalized on the global stage. Israel and Uranglo land make a mockery of the uh, United Nations Charter. How long can this go on, and, and, and when and what will it take for the gates of Jerusalem to change hands for the 45th time? Uh, this, will, this will go long uh, uh, as long as the United States and the European countries are supporting and funding the Israeli occupation who is occupying not only Palestine, but also Lebanese land, Shiba farms, and also occupying Syrian land of the Jolan Heights. As long as the Americans and the Europeans are funding and supporting and allowing the Israeli occupation to do all of the massacres uh, against the pa Palestinian people and to kill the Palestinian people and steal the Palestinian people, people's land is going to keep going. Also, as long as the Security Council and the United Nations is under hostage of the United States, mm -hmm. well, uh, it will also stay like this because in the last 70 years, uh, you know, every time the United Nations and the Security Council come out to do uh, a resolution to condemn the Israeli occupation, the Americans veto it. 
So the uh, United Nation is under hostage of the United States, taken hostage of, under the United States. To, to, t- to, change the, to change the gates, it needs the help and the support of all of the Arab world, not only Syria. For the last 70 years, only Syria and Iran was supporting and funding the resistance in uh, Palestine, and all, not only Palestine, also the resistance in South Lebanon. So it will take the help of all of the Arab world, but uh, unfortunately, the Arab countries, and especially the countries in the Gulf, they are uh, helping and supporting and doing relationship with the Israeli occupation. And they are sad <laughs> yeah, I, know. I know, it's terrible. It's just sad. It's sad. Hey, listen, you know, you said it, t- it would take all the support of the, of, the, of the Arab world, or you could even say the Muslim world. But I know this is a crazy thought, but I have actually closed my eyes many times. And because, you know, I've been, I've been to, what is called Israel, as far as I'm concerned, is Palestine. I've been to Jordan. I've been to Egypt. I've been to Syria. I've been through all that area. And um, I, I, why don't a couple of million, million or three million neighbors uh, surround, surrounding Israel just start marching to the borders and overrun the place. They couldn't kill them all. Just, you know, why don't, why don't a couple of three million people just storm the country? I mean, they can't kill them all. Uh, actually, first of all, that will cause a, uh, a war in the region. And we're talking a war in the region that will, uh, the Americans will step in. And the Americans, if the Americans step in, it's, uh, it might flip into a uh, regional war and maybe a world war. Uh, On one side, you have Syria and Iran from one side. On the other side, you have the Americans, you have the Europeans, you have the Israeli occupation, uh, you have the Arab countries that will support the United States. So it's unbalanced. That war is unbalanced. The only way is to do it by resistance, small group resistance, as we're seeing in Palestine and in Lebanon. That's the only way to finish and to defeat that occupation by resistance. In that way, they will be forced to sit on the table and give the Palestinians their rights, the Syrian their rights, and the Lebanese their rights. Yeah, and with, thank goodness for Hezbollah, because without Hezbollah, uh, south, s- southern Lebanon would already be occupied by Israel. So um, much is made, and you, since you uh, uh, were born and grew up in, um, in uh, Syria, much is made of the <laughs> infamous Sunni-Shia uh, schism in Islam, and um, of course uh, Syria has both Sunni and uh, Shia, much like the Catholic, Protestant, uh, Orthodox one in Christianity, it seems to be a defining fixture with relations between largely Shia Iran and the Sunni Gulf states, although Saudi Arabia has a lot of Shias also. Yet I have read that this Muslim divide was not always the case, um, that before the arrival of Western empires, always successful divide and conquer playbook, Shias and Sunnis largely coexisted in peace and harmony since the seventh century. Is this true? Uh, is being at each other's throats Western propaganda to weaken the Muslim world, or has it always been an inter- internecine dogfight? Uh, actually, no. This, uh, uh, this war is new between the Sunni and Shiites. Uh, they used to always live uh, in peace. And, uh, but uh, when did this especially start? Is after the Islamic revolution of Iran, took over before when the Shah of Iran was in charge, the, the Muslims and the Shiites, were, they loved each other and they had good, uh, they were friendship. The same thing with Saudi and Iran, they had good friendship and they were allies. As long as the, when the people in charge of Iran, they were under the, as they say, they were American puppets, the Shiites were good and everyone was good. Now, uh, <laughs> when... Uh, now, when the when the Iran is under the hands of uh, it's not under the hands of the Americans, and they are resisting and refusing to go under the Americans, uh, they, the the Americans by their media, and by the Middle East media, who is supported by the petrodollar, they flipped and then they changed and they brainwashed the Arab uh, Arab world's mind <laughs> from making 
the enemy that uh, making Israel the enemy and they flipped it and they made the enemy in the Arab mind, uh, Iran and the Shiites, they are the enemy. That's okay. what the Americans did by their media, by their uh, secret service and by uh, all the ways they could have did. did. Yeah, okay, so, so, it, so it is a post-war colonial um, 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 fabrication. Well, you know, before uh, before the uh, in China, before um, Mao Zedong and the communists um, uh, gained China's uh, liberation from the West, uh, America loved uh, China. You know, with the uh, with Chiang Kai Shek and the fascists uh, and the fascist, uh, you know, uh, KMT. They loved China. And then, as soon as the communists took over, all of a sudden, everything everything changed, and and then and China became became you know the boogeyman, the boogeyman of um, of Asia. So uh, it's funny how that happens, isn't it? Yes, it does. Uh, Raman Mazahari just wrote a great article explaining the origins and current events in Lebanon. Um, he said that blaming Iran for pulling the strings there via Hezbollah is a big lie propaganda to deflect the true reality. Lebanon is still a French colony in all but name, and the only finger in the dike of Zionist takeover is uh, Hezbollah. Um, please share your thoughts on your country of residence. Uh, first of all, uh, the situation in Lebanon is not new. Uh, Lebanon was uh, unstable since the 70s and 80s. And we all know that Lebanon went through a really bad civil war. Uh, since 1990, the civil war finished until this day today. Lebanon is split in half. Half is uh, they work with the Americans and French, and they are uh, employees for the Americans and French. Then the other side is their allies with uh, Syria and Iran, like Hezbollah, like uh, Amal Movement, like the Syrian Social Nationalist Party, and others. So Lebanon is split in half, and all the instability is because there's foreign and regional war happening on this land inside of Lebanon. Yeah, when the American-Iranian deal happened, Lebanon was stable. When it lit up, Lebanon lit up and the tension grew higher. So it's, uh, Lebanon is stable when the regional power is uh, and there's no government except if the whole all of the regional power they accept it and that's uh, their problem with lebanon they do not have uh, a decision of their own they are run by other countries yeah yeah in his article he talked about how like hariri and all these um wealthy families are nothing you know less than no, nothing less than just gangsters who are basically um you know, uh, profiting, you know, profiting from the country and, and uh, at the expense of, 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 of the of the middle class and the poor. And if it wasn't for Hezbollah, there'd be a lot of starving people. Okay. The United States is brazenly stealing Syria's natural resources by refusing to leave the country. Uh, and so they're occupying its oil fields. Not that this kind of imperial theft has not been going on for centuries, but Trump tweeting and bragging about it takes Western exploitation and extraction to new levels of chutzpah, to uh, coin a, a Yiddish word. <laughs> this is an incredible insult to Syria, not to mention Turkey's occupation of its northern border areas. How do you see this playing out? Uh, doesn't Syria have to attack the American forces and take back their rightful land and resources? What will happen with Turkey? Will they annex more Syrian territory? We'll start from the end, from Turkey. Uh, the Turkish, they will uh, pull out under an agreement with the Russians. Yeah. The Russians will not allow the Turkish to stay in one piece of land, especially in northeast Syria where all of the oil wells, and everyone knows the oil wells and the gas wells are all going to go to Russian companies. Everyone knows that already. Number two, about American-Syrian war and a conflict between the two countries, that is actually is a suicide. Syria is a 23 million. It cannot fight a country of 300 million. 
and the Russians, they will not get into a war with the United States over Syria and cause a world war. The, uh, the way to get the Americans out is people resistance. The people of the area, of the people of the south, uh, the north east of Syria mm -hmm. to do uh, the resistance when, they, when the Americans and the American people and the American taxpayer see that their soldiers are coming back in coffins and uh, they're seeing that the people of that area are refusing and resisting, their, uh, uh, resisting them being there, then the Americans, they will pressure their congressmen and, uh, to, and force them to pull out just like what happened in uh, Vietnam when the Americans pressure the American people pressured the uh, American administration and they forced the Americans to pull out of Vietnam it was the American people uh, so and uh, about stealing the oil the Americans they don't need the oil in the east of Syria and they are there for only for one reason and one reason only we all know the rebuilding of Syria is going to cost over 500 billion dollars and the Americans they want their, as they say, they want their piece of the pie in the rebuilding of Syria, in the gas, in the oil, electricity, infrastructure, everything. So in that way, they will be putting pressure on the Iranian, on the Russians, and on the Syrians to participate and to make a deal with the Americans. And they will say, we will pull out, but you have to give us contracts of rebuilding. But that will not happen. Uh, 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 uh. Uh, that will not happen until the new pres American presidential election. Either President Trump will be uh, doing that deal in the new term, or a new administration, maybe the Democrats. Huh, I hadn't thought about that, because I was under the impression that Syria was was going to make sure that the Russians and the Chinese got got most of the contracts. But maybe yeah, this. The Chinese. And the Russians, yeah, and, and probably Iran, anything, any, all, all, all of Syria's allies. I hadn't thought about that, using the occupation and theft of the oil as a bargaining ship to get, to extort contracts out of uh, the Syrian government. What are the Western, uh, you know, the U.S., uh, European uh, sanctions on Syria, and how are they affecting the people? Uh, affecting the people because uh, big time after... Uh, from the currency, the Syrian currency have dropped really bad today. Every one dollar is 750 Syrian pounds. Uh, it's causing, uh, first of all, uh, so everyone can know Syria before the war on Syria, it used to make its own gasoline, its own fuel, and also it used to make its their own clothes, each uh, from what they grow. They did not need to import anything. They had everything. The Syrian factories in Aleppo, Mm -hmm. They were making everything. They did not need to import anything. After the war started, the, uh, the Syrians and the, the factories were stolen by uh, the Turkish and by the terrorist group, so-called Moderate Troubles, FSA. They, uh, they stole the factories. Syria needs to import now. Syria today, it makes only 34,000 barrels. It used to make 400,000. 34,000 is not enough for the Syrian people. So they are need. They need to import everything, and at the same time, they cannot import anything because of the sanctions on Syria. So it's uh, high prices. The uh, the Syrian currency is not doing good, and we also we also saw when the Americans hijacked and kidnapped the uh, Iranian oil tanker when it's come it was coming to Syria to give the Syrian people the oil and the fuel for the winter. Sorry, Stephen. I just saw. I got a. Some light shining on my face. Here we go. <laughs> Through the window. Sorry about that. Yeah, sanctions are nothing more than just, uh, they're, it's, it's, it's an act of war. It's, uh, sanctions are war crimes. And um, it just seems like that's all the West knows how to do now. Either that or steal ships, you know, piracy. Uh, you know, the, uh, stealing the Iranian ship in the Mediterranean that was going to Syria. Um, it's just... They have no other. They have. They have no other diplomacy except to, you know, s sanction, blockade, um, f you know, steal, steal assets from around the world, uh, like they're doing to Venezuela, and um, it's war. It's literally war crimes. It's really um, uh, a a a a uh, horrific and 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 as you said, it's killing people. I mean, if you can't buy medicine and you can't buy. Um, 
food, people are going to starve and people are going to die. And um, and uh, just like they are in Venezuela, I'm sure it's having a horrific effect on uh, on the Syrian people. The situation in, uh, but on that same subject, the situation in Syria economically is bad. But uh, thank God there's a lot of factories have came back into uh, business, like the medicine factory. Now Syria, even we're still through the war, but now Syria fixed the, the medicine factories and they fix, and now Syria makes 90% of what they need, and especially okay. the cancer medication. So that's something good about Syria that they can, they can rebuild in, uh, uh, fast. They, ha they have the ability, they have the mind, they have, uh, uh, so the, the situation is really bad. But not to a bad to an extent we can say it starve like Venezuela. Because Syria yeah. depends on several other assets more than oil uh, and more yeah. more than other things. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. We all know how crucial Russia's cooperation with Syria is to keep it from being balkanized and turned into another Western abortion like Libya. But where does China fit in the picture? A, a couple of years ago, uh, Stephen. There was talk that China had quietly uh, sent military advisors to Syria. I, I think it was through the uh, Russian port of Tartus, um, but in very Confucian style, uh, was denied by Baba Beijing. Uh, was and is this true? In either case, is China helping Syria directly with signal, uh, satellite, and human intelligence, or is it doing so by passing information along uh, via Moscow? Uh, first of all, the Chinese-Syrian relation is, uh, and the ties has been, uh, and the cooperation between the two countries on all sides, militarily, uh, by secret service, economically, politically, it's been not from no, it's been even from the before the war. But it grew after the war, uh, and we all saw the Chinese in the Security Council, how they vetoed the Americans several times them and the Russians, uh, secret by uh, information that always happens between the two countries. Okay. Between China and uh, Syria and between Syria and Russia. Uh, but uh, they did not send anyone. They support Syria through the Russians uh, and uh, they support fighting terrorism because not only China, but everyone, all of the countries, they do not want those terrorists, especially in the, uh, in the province, to go back to, the, to their countries, especially to the China. Chinese, they don't want those, uh, those terrorist murders to cause problems for them, to go back to China and cause them problems. Yeah. So the whole world wants to eliminate them in that city. But unfortunately, the Americans are supporting those terrorists. <laughs> yeah, they are American terrorists. <laughs> <laughs> American employees. <laughs> American employees. Oh my gosh! So the Chinese are providing the the signal and the signal and human and satellite intelligence, but they they did not send anybody to Tartus or. That's or, my they, information. Okay, go. Okay, go. I know their their Ministry of State Security. Their secu you know, their, their 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 version of the CIA is one of the best in the world, and uh, I'm sure they're, they've got a lot of information to help the Syrians. The U.S. refuses to leave Iraq, too. Is the West stealing oil there, too? Is it to harass Iran or to keep those taxpayer-funded billion-dollar military contracts and corruption flowing? What's going on? In a recent uh, uh, RT opinion piece, it was suggested that it is to limit China's influence uh, in Iraq. Uh, what do you think? Actually, it's all of what you said. It's all <laughs> <Okay>. of <it>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because uh, first of all, uh, we uh, let's start from the war on Iraq in 2003. There was no uh, weapons of mass destruction. Everyone knew about. Uh, everyone, we all know about that now. And it was to store its steel. The oil of Iraq, the gold of Iraq, and most important, the equities of Iraq. We all know Iraq is one of the oldest, uh, all of the oldest countries in the on the face of the earth. So, and we all saw from the first day of the bombing, the Americans went into the uh, Baghdad Museum and stole everything from inside of it and wiped it out. And that's uh, 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 and also 
the Americans are funding and supporting the politicians in Iraq today, the corrupted uh, politicians, because to get from them and to get the contracts from them and to help uh, to get the, Ameri uh, the American companies the contracts and making them money. At the same time, by the uh, Americans staying in Iraq, it's for two ways. It's to harass Iran from one side and to stop the Chinese uh, from the other side. This goes back, especially on the Chinese American, and I'm working on an article about that. The Chinese American, uh, the Chinese American trade war. The American uh, came to uh, the Israeli occupation and Benjamin Netanyahu and threatened him after he did contracts with China recently. The same thing they did with Lebanon. They threatened Lebanon. Do not do any contracts and rebuilding contracts with China. Uh, the same thing we saw in, uh, we're seeing with Egypt. So any countries that think about putting their hands with China, the Americans go and threaten them and uh, blackmail them. Uh, and that is because the Chinese are getting bigger. They are spreading, uh, spreading and the people and the countries of the world, they want, they are sick and tired of uh, uh, the America being the police of the world. They want to go to other countries. And we've seen that the Turkey and uh, Egypt halfway, they went with the uh, they went with the Russians and the, the Chinese. Today, uh, it's a superpower economy. No one can uh, defeat it. So it is uh, the, uh, all of this on um, all of the Americans' action is uh, a trade war between the Americans and the Chinese. And uh, we are we're concentrating on the Middle East, but there's a huge war, an economical and a trade war going happen between Beijing and Washington in Africa mm -hmm. between the. Uh, between the African, uh, between the American companies and the Chinese companies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. Um, I think, I think, uh, I think to call the United States and and Europe, you know, the policemen of the world is really too kind. It's more like the mafia gangsters. I mean, it's 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 it's, it's uh, the that's. You know, uh, I, I interviewed Douglas Valentine and I read, you know, his book, you know, the CIA is organized crime, but it's not just the CIA. Western Western governance is, you know, like like organized crime. So um, not something to be too proud of. Yes. Well, listen, besides the Mideast discourse, what other projects do you have in the uh, in the pipeline, Stephen? Uh, actually, I'm working, I'm writing writing articles uh, every week I have about two two articles I publish at Middle East discourse at the same time I I'm a, I edit I'm an editor on uh, I don't only manage it but I'm also an editor on Middle East discourse in both languages Arabic and English so that's taking all uh, about all of my time in I bet also, yeah, I can imagine. also with uh, interviews radio and TV interviews with several channels, CGTN, RT, NTV, and stuff like that, and Press TV also. Okay, great. Well, listen, Stephen, this has been a great interview. Maybe we should uh, just kind of do an update every, because um, uh, China Rising Radio Sino Land, uh, you know, uh, you know, has um, has ha has a lot of um, fans out there that. Um, may not uh, may not know about you maybe maybe you sh maybe you can come back on in a few months and we can just kind of catch up on news and see what's going on and um uh the, the 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 pulse of the world the middle east okay i'm ready anytime <laughs> all right hey listen Stephen. thank you very much i'll uh, send this to you when it's ready and you can blast it out to the world okay i'm ready i will do that all right talk to you later later bye-bye